Hello everyone and welcome to a new lecture in the topic of STEMI and today we are speaking about an interesting lecture which is Pasteur MI. Of course we have spoken about this topic as we have spoken also about RB function in the lecture of ACG in the STEMI but as I mentioned in the last lecture that I choose to have a dedicated lecture for these two topics the RV function and the Pasteur MI because they are very important and easily missed in our clinical practice. So that's why we choose this lecture today and our ILOs are to understand how to diagnose posterior MI and how to perform posterior ECG bleeds. First question, why is it important to diagnose posterior MI? Some patients present with typical chest pain and apparently normal ECG or just ST depression in the right precordial leads. But the problem that they are dealt with as non-STEMI for early invasive strategy rather than STEMI for primary PCI and posterior myocardial infarction is considered as an equivalent for STEMI in the posterior wall of the heart. So that's why it is a malpractice to consider posterior MI as just non-STEMI for early invasive strategy. Of course, we remember this diagram that we have used in the lecture of RV infarction and we remember the anatomy here for the RCA, left main, LD, and LCX. And of course, the problem here is that there is a thrombus that may be occluding, for example, posterior descending artery, which arises from RCA if it is dominant in about 80% of the cases. Sometimes it is a thrombus occluding the OM branch for OM1, OM2, or maybe occluding the LCX proper itself. And so, the problem is that these regions or these territories supply the posterior wall of the heart. So, when there is a thrombus occluding one of these vessels, this may result in posterior myocardial infarction. So the culprit vessel in most of the cases of serum MI is just the RCA or the LC exclusion, the vessel itself or one of its branches. The second question, is posterior MI is that common? The answer is, posterior MI occurs in about 15 to 20 percent of STEMIs, especially of course with inferior STEMI and lateral STEMI. In that case, we call it emperor STEMI and posterior lateral STEMI or sometimes emperor posterior lateral STEMI. And needless to say, presence of additional posterior myocardial infarction increases the magnitude of damage to the heart and so of course when the size of MI is larger this indicates worse prognosis higher risk of LV dysfunction and higher risk of arrhythmic complications so it is important to recognize that it is additional posterior MI for the risk stratification of the patient the second thing is that isolated posterior MI may occur isolated in about 3 to 11 percent of MI patients so it is not uncommon to see a patient presenting with typical chest pain and he's having just posterior myocardial infarction. So MI or posterior MI is common to be seen in your practice and so it is important to learn how to diagnose it. Another terminology for posterior MI is emphrobasilar MI which is written in some literature. So that's why I have written this expression here. Let's learn now how to diagnose posterior MI. Of course, the first thing is the standard 12 lead surface ECG. When we see that there is ST depression in V1 to V4 of more than or equal 0.5 mm, we store our waves. But another thing is a posterior ECG leads. This can be confirmed here by presence of concomitant ST elevation of more than or equal 0.5 mm in leads V7 to V9, which are called the posterior ECG leads. Let's start with the 12 lead surface ECG. The first criterion is presence of horizontal ST depression more than or equal 0.5 mm in V1 to V4, which I mean here is the right recorded leads. I don't mean that the four leads should be involved, no. The whole leads may be involved or just some of them, like from V1 and V2, V1, 2 and 3, V2 and 3, V2 and 3 and 4. So uh, these are the leads who can be involved in case of posterior MI showing horizontal ST depression. The second criterion is a tall R wave with R is ratio more than 1 and this is very important criterion to diagnose posterior MI because sometimes you may see just ST depression in V1 and V2 without any tall R wave. For example, in case of RV infarction, you may see ST depression in V2 but the R wave is small and this is not a diagnostic criterion for posterior MI. You should say tall R wave with R is ratio more than 1 in order to diagnose posterior MI. The third thing is that in most of the cases, the R wave duration is more than 30 milliseconds as an equivalent to pathological Q, as we will say later. And the fourth criterion is that mostly the T wave would be upright. So, the question here, why? Why this ECG or this unique ECG features occur in case of posterior MI? 
Why didn't we see its elevation as we see in most cases of STEMI? The answer here can be shown in this diagram, which is a cut section of the heart, and you can see the six precorded leads. When the patient has posterior wall myocardial infarction, the cart of injury is directed toward the back of the patient. And so if we collect these four leads together, we can see that the current of injury is away from their positive poles. And so what do you expect to see in these leads when the current is away from them? Remember the lecture of basics of ECG, it is away from them. So of course here the right precordial leads would show ST depression and toll are wave instead of a C elevation and pathological cue. Because if the current of injury was toward them, it would show a C elevation and with start of formation of pathological cue as an injury to the heart. But here it is the reverse or the mirror image. So it would be ST depression and toll are wave instead of ST elevation and pathological cue. The second thing that I would see a T wave instead of T wave inversion in the evolving stage of MI. So this diagram explains why we would see this. So we can consider as from V1 to V4 are showing the reciprocal changes to the C elevation in the posterior wall of the heart. Remember, of course, this feature in the ECG in STEMI lecture that we mentioned how to define pathological cue. Remember this criterion, which was the last one that was sometimes or somewhat strange to many of you. The R wave when it is more than 40 milliseconds in V1 and V2 with R ratio more than 1 and concordant positive T wave in absence of conduction defect. This is one of the definitions for pathological Q. So now we understand why. Because pathological Q in case of posterior MI would appear as tall R wave more than 40 milliseconds in V1 and V2 with predominantly positive complex due to posterior MI and now we understand why. Of course, here, as we can see, that the 12 lead service ECG is showing these the criteria, which is the tall R wave and ST depression in the right precordial leads. So we can consider this like as a mirror image of this actual ECG pattern. The original pattern that should appear here is ST elevation with pathological cue as the current of injury is directed toward the back of the patient. So the question now, where can we see these changes? Of course, it is in the posterior. ECG leads because if the right precordial lead are showing the mirror image of this ECG pattern so the posterior ECG leads would show the original pattern of ST elevation pathological Q and T wave inversion as we are getting the image upside down so let's learn how to put the posterior ECG leads we know of course the anatomical positions for the standard ECG leads regarding the precordial leads so what we can do here in this example for V4, 5, and 6, that I turn the patient on his abdomen and on his back I can put the ECG leads, but now I will call them V7, V8, V9 as we are numbering them after number 6. So V7 would be in the left posterior axillary line at the same horizontal plane as V6, so it would be in the fifth intercostal space. V8 would be towards the tip of the left scapula at the same horizontal plane as well, and V9 would be at the left pars terminal. Line. So the posterior ECG leads here are put in the back of the patient in this anatomical location to record the ECG changes of the posterior STEMI and that's why it is important to know how to use or how to perform posterior ECG leads. So if we answer the question regarding how to diagnose posterior MI in the 12 lead surface ECG, so in the posterior ECG lead just a C elevation of more than or equal 0.5 millimeter in lead V7, 8 and 9 are enough to diagnose posterior MI. And so posterior STEMI is considered like an equivalent of the ST elevation because it's actually a ST elevation in the posterior wall of the heart and this can be confirmed by the posterior ACG leads. So let's see this example here. We can see here that we have a C elevation in the inferior lead, so we have inferior STEMI. We have a ST elevation in V5, V6, so it is lateral STEMI and as well we have ST depression in V1, 2 and 3 and also in V4 and there is tall R wave in V2, 3 and 4 so we can say here that this is infrapostural lateral STEMI we have inferior STEMI plus lateral STEMI and as well as posterior STEMI as proved here by the right precordial leads in this example we can see here that we have put these four, five, and six at the back of the patient. So they are now called V7, V8, and V9, and they are showing ST elevation 
in the posterior ECG leads. So here we can confirm that the posterior STEMI together with the inferior STEMI. Also in this ECG example, we can see here that there is ST elevation in the inferior leads and we can see here that there is ST depression with predominantly positive complex it's starting from V3 but here it is extending till V6 which is something strange but it can be explained by one of two things dilated LV in some cases this means that the apex is shifted and so the change extends to the left precordial lead as we can see sometimes in patient with left bundle branch block and his apex is shifted due to dilated dimension so I can see the QS pattern or the small R and deep S pattern in V1 to V6 instead of seeing the predominantly R wave in V5, V6. So this is an explanation or sometimes positional change in the leads so that sometimes the leads are not put in the exact correct anatomical positions. So this may explain that the ST depression here is shown till V6. So here we are speaking about infraposterior STEMI. In this is the example we can see here that the V4, 5 and 6 were put on the back of the patient and so they are posterior ECG lead here and they are showing a C elevation of about 0.5 mm which is enough to diagnose posterior STEMI and so we can see here that it is isolated posterior STEMI of course we can see that there are pathological cue in the inferior leads and minimal C elevation which may be recent and in that case we can call it infraposterior STEMI or if it may be something old and in this case, we can call it that it is just isolated posterior STEMI. Of course, as the lecture was mentioned, it is called posterior myocardial infarction. But I can add ST elevation here based on the features that we see in the posterior ECG leads. And so, posterior MI is actually STEMI, so you can call it posterior STEMI, and I prefer to call it posterior STEMI because it is not non-STEMI, it is actually STEMI. And so it is more accurate to call it posterior STEMI rather than posterior MI in order to schedule the patient for primary PCI. So please, posterior MI is actually STEMI and the patient should be scheduled for primary PCI, not just antiplatelet therapy and arrange for early invasive strategy. That's why in 2020 AC guidelines for the non-EC elevation acute coronary syndrome, it was emphasized that use of additional ECG leads like the right ECG leads and the posterior ECG leads are recommended and is class 1 indication in case that the 12 lead standard ECG is inconclusive. So please don't omit the posterior ECG leads or the right ECG leads in your clinical practice, especially when the 12 lead ECG is inconclusive and the patient is having severe typical chest pain. In that case, you should perform posterior ECG leads, right ECG leads in order to make accurate diagnosis. And posterior ECG leads are much, much more important because it can be isolated to your MI. So you should learn how to do them because at the time you can ask the nurse that I want to have posterior ECG leads for this patient. So at the end of our lecture, we understood today how to diagnose posterior STEMI and we understood how to perform posterior ECG leads. And our take home message, posterior ECG leads are essential in patient presenting with typical chest pain and apparently normal ECG. And the last thing, and of course, all of you remember now, posterior MI is considered as a STEMI, and so the patient should be scheduled for primary PCI. Thank you very much for your watching.